Like all sciences, psychology has its own timeline of development. And like all sciences, it can be traced back to the ancient Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle. But after their original kind of philosophical investigation of the human mind and human behavior, not really much was done for hundreds and hundreds of years. It wasn't until much later that we got to the empirical movement, uh, the empiricists, and then that eventually faded, giving way to the rationalists, and after the rationalists came the existentialists, and after that, that's when we started to see the rise of true, like, scientific psychology. Uh, you could also call it experimental psychology. And then after that, we have the functionalists, and the behaviorists, and the gestaltists, and the psychoanalysts. And eventually, we get to where we are today, which you could call the cognitivist. Uh, branch of psychology. Like I said, it all started with the ancient Greek philosophers like Plato, for example. Plato was a student of Socrates and his primary contribution was his theory of forms. So the whole idea here is that the human brain and the human mind are two completely separate things. Like the brain is physical, it's material, and the mind is kind of spiritual, it's ephemeral, it's disconnected in that way. And uh, one of the earliest scientists, you could say, is probably Aristotle. He talked a lot about human thoughts, like human memories and things like that. Human cognition. Sensation and perception kind of stuff. But this whole idea of a physical, you know, brain and a kind of spiritual mind this was a pretty popular idea for quite a long time. Uh, many of us still kind of think of it this way. Many of us think of it as though the brain is something physical and what's going on in your head is somehow disconnected from that. I'll talk more about that in a moment, but that was still a pretty popular idea when eventually the empiricists came along. So the empiricists, the empirical movement, I also talked about this kind of dualism. So they would t say things like the body is like a machine whereas the mind does not follow the laws of nature. So this is where we get people like Descartes. Uh, he's one of the primary people who talked about this dualism. That's why we call it like Cartesian dualism. Later on when the rationalists came about they, they were lar very similar to the empiricists in many ways. Uh, the empiricists use something called induction that's where first you come up with a conclusion and then you look for supporting evidence. Whereas these rationalists, they use the opposite. They use deduction. So that's a process where you just collect the evidence and try to figure out what the conclusions are based on that evidence. So here we have people like Immanuel Kant, who believed that our mind organizes perception in basic categories. And uh, Johann Herbart for, uh, is another just example. This, you know, branch of psychology eventually faded, giving way to existentialism. And the existentialists stressed the meaning of human existence. You know, they talked about things like uh, the meaning of life, the meaning of death, our capacity of free will, and the responsibility that comes with it. So here we have individuals like uh, Kierkegaard, who argued things like truth is subjective, and each individual must find their own truth in life, and Nietzsche, Frederick uh, Nietzsche. You may have heard of Frederick Nietzsche. He's still a rather controversial figure. He was controversial back then too. He, he wasn't a very fun guy to be around. He didn't have too many friends. But he had some really cool ideas. Like he's one of the people who talked about um, will to power. Like you've ever, if you've ever heard of the concept of a ubermensch, you know, just uh, like a superman. N not not superman like the comic book character, but like somebody who's just becoming as powerful as they can be. And another thing that made him really controversial is one of his most famous quotes is, God is dead. Now, he's not act literally saying somebody killed God or something like that. What he's saying is that the concept of God, the concept that most religions give us, 
with regard to spirituality is like a it's an easy way out it's an easy shortcut to all the major problems of human existence and instead of just taking this you know easy way out what people should do is they should face their own existence and really try to figure out their own answers in other words don't just read answers in a book and accept that as your truth you should come up to your own answers through your own quest your own kind of spiritual enlightenment but none of this was scientific uh, it wasn't until about the 1820s to 1890s that we started to see individuals doing more like scientific kind of research in psychology. Like we have Helmholtz, who developed numerous theories on sensation and perception. And then there's uh, Gustav Fechner, who was one of the first people to develop psychophysics. So that's just a branch of research where we look at how human perception and human sensations are related. But it wasn't until uh, Wilhelm Wundt, or if you're not German, you could just say Wilhelm Wundt, came about that we saw the first true uh, like scientific research laboratory for psychology. So we definitely consider Wilhelm Wundt to be like the father of modern psychology. And I know that's a little bit confusing because most people think that's Freud, uh, Sigmund Freud. I'll talk about, a little about Freud in a minute, but no, Wilhelm Wundt is considered the father of like scientific psychology. <clears throat> and the structuralist movement that followed is largely based on his work. It's based on his ideas. So the whole idea of structuralism is that we're trying to just figure out how the brain, how the consciousness is structured. But it was heavily criticized due to just the fact that it wasn't scientific enough. So while it established psychology as a science, it was not considered scientific enough for a lot of people back then. But Wilhelm Wundt's ideas were still extremely popular, and they were eventually brought to the U.S. by uh, a researcher by the name of Edward Titchener. So he's considered like one of the most important figures, at least in our country, with regard to scientific psychology. So structuralism, being heavily criticized, eventually faded away, and then we got what's called functionalism. So functionalism was heavily inspired by Charles Darwin's theories of, you know, natural selection, for example. So uh, functionalism is all about how humans and animals use their mental processes to adapt to the environment. And adaptation is a very important term. Like I said, uh, it was heavily inspired by, you know, survival of the fittest kind of ideas. And one of the primary people from the functionalist movement was William James. Now, this is around the time that we start to see uh, psychoanalysis. So this is Sigmund Freud. So Sigmund Freud uh, was not a scientist. He did not do any scientific research, not, not even a little. What Sigmund Freud did was he was like a clinician. He was a mental health professional. He was helping people uh, recover from serious like trauma and things like that. All of Freud's theories and ideas were developed from his interactions with his clients like this. And m most of his theories are still very popular today. Like, the primary idea that Freud developed is that an individual's thoughts, feelings, and behavior are deter determined primarily by unconscious forces. So there's these parts of your brain that you're not aware of, these parts of your brain that you're not aware of that are affecting you in ways that you don't know. Like, and most of this stuff that is in our unconscious mind, Freud would say, is mostly sexual stuff, some violent stuff too. So it's the stuff that we don't really want to think about because it upsets us in many different ways. Freud also talked a lot about personality. He talked about things like the, the three factors of what he called the psyche. So that would be the id and the ego and the superego and stuff like that. And we're going to go into a lot of detail about that stuff later in the semester. Now, Gestaltists, uh, the Gestalt movement, that was all about just trying to look at the person as a whole. So if you've ever heard the phrase, the whole is 
more than the sum of its parts? Well, that's, that's the primary idea of Gestaltism. So the whole idea here is that thinking, learning, and perception should be studied holistically, not by trying to you know, separate them out and examine them individually. We need to look at the person as a whole person, to put it simply. And then we have behaviorism, which is definitely considered one of the most scientifically based branches of psychology. The whole idea here is that we are simply going to attempt to describe behavior in terms of how that animal is responding to the environment. So with behaviorism, we're just looking at environmental factors and the animal's behavior. And one of the major figures here is Ivan Pavlov, who discovered classical conditioning. But his ideas were brought to the U.S. by John Watson, who has gained some fame by doing something we refer to as the Little Albert experiment. You may have heard of that. If not, I'm going to talk about it in a lot of detail uh, when we get to the behaviorism videos. But another really important figure would be B.F. Skinner, who discovered what we now call operant conditioning. Kind of in reaction to the behaviorist movement, we have the humanists. So humanism is kind of like the anti-behaviorism in some senses. It's all about trying to look at what makes humans special, look at how we can make people happier, live more fulfilled lives. It's all about the concept of free will. So it's very similar to existentialism in many ways. But the basic idea of humanism is just helping people live happier, healthier lives. So some of the major figures here would be Carl Rogers, who was credited with founding be uh, humanism. He also developed something called person-centered therapy. And then there's Abraham Maslow. You may have heard of his hierarchy of needs. If not, we'll talk about that in a different video. But definitely where we are today is in the cognitivist uh, branch. So cognitivism, uh, cognitive psychology, is all about just studying mental processes. So studying things like attention and language and memory, intelligence, problem solving, sensation perception, and so on. Uh, George Miller is often credited as founding this you know, cognitive psychology. But another really important figure would be Noam Chomsky, who really made cognitive psychology very popular by initiating what we call the cognitivist movement. So he did that by just, you know, publishing a lot of harsh critiques of the other, you know, popular branches at the time and really encouraging people to be interested in these kinds of mental processes. So that brings us to where we are today. Today, uh, there's basically four different levels of analysis that different researchers will focus on. So some researchers will focus on the biological level, others uh, on the individual level, or maybe the social level, or the cultural level. So those are the four levels. Now, while I say that most researchers will focus on one of these, it's, that is true, but a lot of times researchers will also sometimes, you know, incorporate other levels too. But you'll know you're doing biological research if you're interested in things like the internal physical, chemical, and biological processes of the brain. So if you're doing neuroscience, to put it simply, if you're using like functional magnetic resonance imaging or some other kind of brain scanning technology, that's definitely at the biological level of human thought and behavior. The next level, that individual level, now we're going to be focusing on how individual differences in personality and mental processes can affect perception and understanding. Uh, if you're doing research in this domain, then you're probably interested in things like gender differences, uh, personality, uh, various kinds of cognitive skills, and so on. If you're, interested, if you're interested in doing research at the social level, now you're going to be looking at how people are influenced by others. So how people affect their family and friends and coworkers and how those family and friends and coworkers affect them. So research in this domain focuses on things like stereotypes, uh, persuasion, language and communication, uh, stuff like that. 
And then the fourth level would be the cultural level. So now we're looking kind of like greater, like how societies, two different societies interact. So this is about how human behavior can be explained through describing uh, individuals' background and cultural experiences. Uh, there's this concept of cultural relativity and the whole idea here is that we just have to judge a person's behavior in relation to their culture so for example something that we do in our country that's perfectly normal and accepted could be seen as like a mental disorder in a different country it all depends on that country's uh, it all depends on that region's culture so what I'm referring to is you could call it a uh, social norms so social norms are just these kind of unspoken rules that define acceptable behavior in certain kinds of social situations. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of numerous social norms. These are just things you never have to think about because everybody knows it. Like, you should wear pants when you go outside. That's an important social norm in most places. Uh, if you're in the elevator, you should be quiet and you should face forward. If you violate a social norm like one of these, it's going to make everybody uncomfortable, but especially the person who's violating that norm. Like, if you want to see what it's like to violate a social norm, the next time you're in an elevator, just turn 90 degrees facing, you know, face somebody that's standing next to you and just stare at them for the entire elevator ride. It's going to get super weird really fast.